Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 27 today. And uh, we're just going to get right to it. Starting in verse number 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I pray, God, that you would uh, bless this message. And I pray, Lord, that you would just fill me with your spirit and give me your thoughts, your mind, uh, that I may c communicate your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You know, all we have really is today. You don't know what a day may bring forth. You know, it always reminds me of now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. When do you do that? Today. Uh, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Um, and we'll get into Hebrews 3 and we'll see not only does it apply to salvation, but it also applies to the saved man's life. We need to react today. We need to respond today when God convicts us about something. When God directs us or tells us to move forward, we are not to sit there and live in doubt or delay and say maybe tomorrow or maybe a week from now. God wants a response from us today. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Let's look at Hebrews chapter number 3. Probably going to be a short message. Just a short little night run. It's been a couple weeks since I preached a message here. And uh, I hope it's a blessing. We're going to look at most of chapter number 3. More of a Hebrew study of anything. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling... You know, and that word partakers is a very interesting word study that I was actually looking at this morning. and may actually also be a very good message, just doing a word study of partakers. A lot of different things that we can partake of uh, concerning the gospel, concerning Jesus Christ, concerning us as Christians. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It's, not, it's much higher than any kind of calling here in this earth in this world. You know, people have a high calling to Congress. Uh, they have a high calling to the presidency. They have a high calling to the Hall of Fame for baseball or to uh, have their jersey retired. They, there's all kinds of high callings in this world. But there's nothing like the heavenly calling that we are partakers of. Don't, don't, don't put that on the back burner what you're called to do in this world. You're called to be a light to shine. You're called to be a conveyor of the message that even angels do not convey. Angels don't understand. They desire to look into it, but God entrusted us with it. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And in all things, we need to consider Christ Jesus and what we say and what we do, what we think about what we look at. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And that's what God's looking for, faithful men. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who have built the house hath more honor than the house. As much as there was a glory that was there when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments, they had to put a veil over his face, but how much more glorious is the one who who shone that bright light who when he spoke face to face it was an incarnate Christ it, it was it was an old testament old testament appearing of Jesus Christ <laughs> you see the glory of Moses but it's only, it's not because of him it's because of who he met with it's so much greater the builder of the house than the house itself uh, you know, it's funny when you honor the painting without honor, honoring the painter. 
you know, oh, that was by Van Gogh. Oh, that was uh, Mona Lisa. But who was it by? Leonardo da Vinci. Not Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken after. But Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast to confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And I'm not going to get too much into that right now. Uh, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, I guess we will get into it. But Christ, as a son over his own house, Whose house are we? He builded something. Christ said that I will build my church. Uh, and we are his house. We are his also his workmanship. We are also the, uh, the tabernacle where Christ dwells in his body. Uh, Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end you know and some people would use that as a verse to say that you could lose your salvation you know you can't take one verse that's kind of obscure and and, and maybe you misunderstand and, and and misapply it but God does not want us to forget the gospel God says that if you believe the gospel uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, I believe chapter number 14 this is the gospel, how that Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And it, right after that it says, unless you believed in vain. Uh, this could be talking about such a deal. If we hold fast to confidence and rejoice into the hope firm unto the end. Uh, I believe that when, once Christ begins a good work in you, he will perform it unto the day of Christ. Uh, Christ creates in you a new creature, and the work that he begins, he will continue. He will continue to set you apart. He will continue to sanctify you. Uh, if we hold fast to confidence, rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. I believe a true Christian never loses hope. Hope of the resurrection. Hope of a home in heaven. Hope of seeing our Savior face to face. Hope of being just like him one day uh, and incapable of sinning when, when we meet him and, and we're like him. Um, you know, I have trouble with those that profess Christ, but they don't hold fast that confidence. They say, oh yeah, I said that prayer. But their confidence is in the prayer. Their confidence is not in the Christ of the prayer. Uh, you know, they soon forget and uh, there's, there's no fruit there, there's no changed life, there's no conversion. All there is is a profession. And those are a dime a dozen, especially in America. Everybody's saved. Everybody has some sort of experience. But how many hold fast to confidence? How many are rejoicing in the hope firm until the end? And it's not your faith that saves you. It's, your not, it's not your faith that keeps you. It's not your faith that you live on. It's not your faith that you serve in. It's all him. It's Christ, his faith working through you. And you know what? He's an overcomer. You might not be able to overcome the world, but he sure can. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice. Today, if you will hear his voice. You know, and we use this oftentimes for those that are lost. If you will hear the gospel today, or today you hear Christ's voice calling you home. Respond if you hear his voice. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work 40 years. But I believe here in Hebrews, God more so is making an application to save people. Uh, not being content with just a gospel that gets you to heaven, but a gospel, a Holy Spirit, a Christ that is able to gets you into the promised land, into the spirit-filled life, into a life more abundant. Don't harden your hearts. It wasn't your father's will, Israel, just to deliver you from Pharaoh and bondage, to wander in a wilderness, to dwell in a wilderness. 
in a barren land, but his intention for you from the beginning was to take you over into a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where they had the big old cluster of grapes that it took a couple men to carry on, 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 on uh, a stick. But that people hardened their hearts. When God sent out the spies, Moses sent out the spies, and the Bible talks about Moses sending out those spies uh, I believe it was God that directed that, but at the same time, there was also a man from each tribe that went and suggested it also. <laughs> I was reading that today. I, I, I kind of missed that. Um, so he sent them, and ten came back with a negative report, and two had a positive report. But like a bunch of Baptists, they believed the negative report. <laughs> How many of us, we believe the lies, we believe the fear mongers, we believe the media, we believe the negative report, but what about the positive report that God would have for us? Oh, we're, we're so full of unbelief. Oh, ye of little faith. Lord, save us because we're going to perish in this storm. <laughs> Where's your faith? He says you're faithless. Harden not your hearts. So... Because of the negative report of 10, the whole congregation, the whole body of believers uh, that were called out as an example to the New Testament church, who's called out of the world, not out of Egypt, but out of the world, so many Christians fall short of this abundant life. So many Christians, their hearts are hardened in that day when God says, do you want to come with me? Do you want to follow me? Joshua was an example of Christ. Moses could not get you into this promised land. The Old Testament law could not get you there, but Christ can get you there. Yeah, but I'm trying to get there by keeping the law, and God says, stop that. Don't harden your heart. Trust me. Uh, cease from your own works and follow after me, and you will truly begin to live, but you got to die to self. But us, just like the children of Israel, we tempt them and we prove them. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, what was his works? He led them by a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud during the day. He had the rock that Moses was supposed to speak to, but yet his unbelief or his problem in communication it wasn't God's problem but his problem was somewhere in the heart he was not supposed to I don't believe even speak to the people he was just supposed to perform this deed but what did he do he yelled at the people then he got mad and he smote the rock twice and because of that even that great man Moses that meek man Moses was not allowed or permitted to enter into that promised land Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. God's will, he showed, he showed his power. Is God not able to establish uh, a table in the wilderness? God can. He did. Oh, we want meat, as they complain. God gave them meat. He gave them quail. He gave them water. He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them all these things. They saw his works for 40 years, but yet they still remained in unbelief. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do all away air in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. And uh, we, we can grieve the Holy Spirit within us, and we can always err in our heart also. And the problem is because you have not known his ways. You might have known about his ways, you might have heard about his ways, but you have not experienced it in such a way that it's life-changing to you. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hmm. That heart of unbelief. The same heart of unbelief that would cause you not to come to Christ for your soul's salvation will also cause you not to believe Christ uh, for the salvation from day to day, from your sin, from this present evil world. 
but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Look at the word daily. We are to exhort one another daily. Not just Sunday, not just Wednesday. We ought to be in communication with the saints daily. We ought to be praying with the saints, exhorting the saints, rebuking, reproving, exhorting, and I, threw, I screwed up the order there. <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Be instant in season, out of season. We are always daily to exhort one another. Then we must need exhorting every single day. We must not have the capability to coast from a Sunday message, but we also need exhortation from one, one another each and every day. While it is called today. <laughs> you see the message about today? Well, I was thinking about edifying so-and-so, but it can wait. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it a week from now. But God says, what about today? All you really have is today. How many people have we planned to call, but we put it off today? And then the next day comes, and the next day comes. But the problem is, all we have really is today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, sin has a way of hardening our hearts. And sin never takes a break. Your sinful desires, the uh, lust of your flesh, never takes a day off. So we need one another to mm, instruct. We need one another to warn when they see something about us that, that, that shows that we're going astray when they see the hardening of our hearts that maybe we can't see so good. That's why it's important to have the body of Christ. That's why it's important that each and every day we exhort one another. We, we commend one another. We say, you know what? Don't fall. Don't fall away. Don't harden your heart. Don't give up. I know it's hard. I, I, I know there's trials, there's tribulations, but I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you, sister. I know that it's tough today, but God says one day all the tears will be wiped away. I know it's tough right now, and we deal with broken bones, we deal with bad backs, we deal with uh, all kinds of um, uncomfortable situations in life, but God says exhort one another every single day, and uh, otherwise we could be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ, and there's that word again, partakers. And it's an interesting study if we find out what it means to be a partaker of Christ. I know a little bit, and I've got a little lead on it, but I don't know as much as I think I know. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We want to be partakers of Christ. And sad to say, we don't want anything to do with his sufferings. But God says, you want to be a partaker of me? you're going to have to suffer with me. You want to reign with me and be glorified with me? Then you're going to have to suffer persecution. You're going to have to uh, endure temptation. You're going to have to take up your cross daily and follow after me. You're going to have to die daily. You're going to have to die to self. You're going to have to die to self-will because Christ did not live after his own will. Christ did not walk after his own accord or what he wanted to do each and every day. No, he sought God the Father, not my will, but thine be done. If it's your will, take this cup away from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You want to be a partaker of Christ? You want to be partaker of the benefit? You need to partake also in the negative aspect of what Christ went through, not just the positive. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end, God is not interested in quitters. God is not interested in you starting something and not finishing it. The world is not interested as well. The world will mock when you begin something. If you say, oh, I'm a Christian, 
and then all of a sudden you see, yeah, I tried that out, and now I'm back to the old me. And they will mock you for that. They will mock Christ for that. God says, I want you to have a confidence that's steadfast to the end that the world will get a taste of, and the world will say, I want that too, because I lack confidence. I lack the ability to have joy and peace, but the Christian that I work with, the Christian that I know, he seems to somehow make it through all these hard times that baffles me. It just baffles me. And uh, that's the kind of testimony we're to have in this world. While it is said, today, today, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. They provoke God. They provoke God with their unbelief. They provoke God with their lack of faith and trust in him. They provoke God when they forgot that he goes before them to fight the giants that were in that land. They saw the walled cities. They saw the enemy that towered over them and they were hardened in their hearts. And God says, I don't want that to be you, Christian. I don't want you to see the giants of sin in your life. I don't want you to see the giants and obstacles on a day-to-day -day basis, financially, uh, you know, uh, troubles in your marriage, troubles at work, tr troubles in life day-to-day -day that you just say, I'm going to quit on God. God says, but you're forgetting an element, the most important element. It's called Christ. Christ goes before you. Verse number 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke You know, it's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to do. It's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to receive. It's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to lay it to heart. Uh, it's one thing to hear, but then are you provoking God? To whom much is given, much is required. It's not enough just to hear, but it's God requires action. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Not, not every one of them. There was two, weren't there? Caleb and Joshua but with whom was he grieved 40 years was it not them or you know and there was also those that were under 20 those that were not at the age of accountability for the children of Israel God says they were able to enter in but all the rest of the generation had to die off they were going to wander 40 years until like each and every one of them were dead and I don't want that to be your life I don't want that to be my life my Christian life God does not want you to be saved and then live and defeat your whole life until you get to heaven. God does not want you to wander in the wilderness uh, of sin and, and go in circles and go nowhere with your Christian life. But sad to say, the vast majority, that's all they ever have in this life. Not the more abundant life. God says, I want to give you life and that more abundantly. They just get life. They get eternal life, but they're not getting the abundant life. And I would be afraid of provoking God to the point where God says, I swear in my wrath you won't enter into my rest. You, you won't know what it is to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You will not know what it is to experience that perfect peace in this life through all the hardships. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, uh, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And oftentimes, God even says there is a sin unto death, and our carcasses can fall. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. God wants us to believe our, our his promises. He wants us to believe the word of God, not just read it. Oh, I read the Bible every day. That's good, but do you believe it? You know, I, I, I know what God says about walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling in the, the lust of the flesh. Yes, but do you apply that ever? Or are you hardened by unbelief? Are you hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin in your life? Maybe you've isolated yourself from the people of God. Maybe you thought you could live this Christian life by yourself. You no longer have those in verse 13 who will exhort you daily, who will steer you 
clear of danger as you harden yourself with your own pride, your own arrogance that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. You can't do that. You, you need the body of Christ. You need one another. You need to surround yourself with those that are strong, those that have a heart of belief in God's promises, those that will help you in this Christian life. And they're, they're around, but if you're just going to stay home, you're not going to go to church anymore, you think you could just get by listening to internet preachers, you're, you're sadly mistaken. You're not understanding what God say, says all throughout the scriptures, the importance of one another. And we're going to go back to verse number 1 of Proverbs 27. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. All you have is today. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. Today, if you're lost, sinner friend, why don't you come to Jesus Christ? Today is the accepted day. You need to accept the Lord while he may be found. You need to call upon him while he is near. He's not always near. He can't always be found. But today, if you hear his voice, you need to trust him. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I just appreciate all you do in my life, and I appreciate that you use me. I, pre I appreciate that you give me this little ministry. And uh, I thank you, and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to do something because it's been two weeks. This has been approved unto God, and I hope you join me again next time. God bless.